Dear intercessors, the title for my message this week is Blessing or Curse. It's a very, very important message. And we're going to begin uh, by reading from Genesis chapter 12 about the calling of Abraham, a familiar text with many of you, I'm sure. From verse 1 in Genesis chapter 12, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed." It's like um, somebody said, God so loved the world that he chose Israel. Israel is called by God to become a blessing in the entire world, to the entire world. And that's what they have already been in so many ways. But their greatest blessing is still ahead. And that's why it is so important for us in this hour towards the end of of this uh, dispensation, this age, that we understand the principle that is outlined so clearly here in this text, that those who bless the descendants of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob, who became Israel, and in other words, the Jewish people today, they will be blessed by God. But the other is also uh, just as sure. If we dishonor, if we take the calling of the Jewish people lightly, we are going to bring a curse upon us. And this is something that is still uh, in effect to this very day. God has never changed his mind when it comes to Uh, the election of Israel. And um, let me go to the New Testament, so called, or I like to call them the apostolic writings, and read from uh, Acts chapter 3, the speech that the Apostle Peter held on the Temple Mount in, in Jerusalem, speaking to the Jewish people. And we will read verses 25 and 26. It says, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. So here we see so clearly that this calling uh, on the Jewish people, it is still also uh, in effect in the new covenant. So it has never changed. In fact, it will never change. Paul is very clear when he writes in um, uh, his epistle, his letter to the believers in Rome, uh, where he says, In chapter 11, I'm going to read from verse 28 and 29. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. Talking about the Jewish people here. But as as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God will never take back this calling on the Jewish people to be a blessing to every family, every nation in the earth. And even though they are enemies of the gospel, 
uh, as a nation today. Um, I'm not talking about individuals here, but as a nation, officially, uh, the Jewish people do not accept the gospel. But still, it says, Paul is very clear here, they are still beloved because of the fathers, because his calling and election can never be removed. It can never be taken back. I want to read a powerful scripture from Jeremiah chapter 31 about this, where it says in verse 3 about Israel, The Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. And in the next verse, it shows very clearly who this is referring to. Again, I will build you and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. God has an eternal love for Israel and for the Jewish people. And if we want to be blessed by him, we need to have the same love in our hearts that God has towards his chosen nation. Of course, uh, very soon, uh, or fairly soon, after a few hundred years, uh, replacement theology came uh, be- became part of the official doctrine of the church, that the church has now replaced Israel as God's chosen people. That is a heresy that is not in line with the word of God. In fact, it's an affront to God. He has uh, never taken back his calling on the Jewish people. In fact, Paul says he cannot do it. It is irrevocable. It can never be taken back. God has no plan B. He will fulfill his plan that he has had from the very beginning. He is not somebody that can fail. God will bring about the fulfillment of his promise to the Jewish people to become a blessing in every nation, to every nation, in all to all the families of the earth, just like he spoke to Abraham. And that is why it's so important for us, if we want to be under God's blessing and favor, we need to make sure that we also will not um, take lightly this uh, calling that God has on the Jewish people. That we will not, um, like it says there in Genesis chapter 12, here in the ESV translation, most people, the uh, most translation have those who uh, curse. Uh, you will be cursed, but it really is more um, accurate to translate it. He who dishonors you, he who dishonors Israel, he who belittles Israel, because it's a different word that is used then uh, when it says that I, God, w- myself will curse. It's bad enough if people curse us, but if God himself says, I will curse you, we better make sure we are not part uh, of that. uh, uh, We are not (laughs) those that will be a part of that curse that God himself has proclaimed to those who belittle or dishonors the calling that God has given to the Jewish people. Now, it's an interesting verse in, um, and before I go to, back to the book of Romans, I'd like to say, uh, just as I mentioned, replacement theology uh, swept into the church fairly on, early on and continued for hundreds of years. Uh, and the sad thing is that the Reformation never corrected that error. Martin Luther, John Calvin, uh, both of them were ardent replacement theologians. Uh, And uh, it took uh, at least, um, well, uh, 
100 more years after them until leaders like Count von Zinzendorf and, and others began to discover the eternal calling that God has on the Jewish people. Uh, I mean, some individuals had the, uh, that understanding even before them, but in uh, to a greater extent, it was not restored until hundreds of years after the reformers. And it's so important if God... Uh, is going to bless his church in the end times. It cannot be a church that claims to have taken the place of Israel as God's chosen people. Like I said, this is a it, it's it's really blasphemous because God will never take back his calling on the Jewish people. So uh, it is a, a wonderful passage here, uh, a verse in specifically in the book of Romans that I want to highlight here, uh, where Paul is saying, uh, it is in verse um, 29, uh, where he has already explained that he is now planning to visit the believers in Rome. And uh, so actually he wrote uh, this letter to the uh, believers in Rome to prepare them for his visit to them. He had longed to be uh, able to come to them for many years, he explains. And when he finally is ready now to come to Rome, he says something uh, specific here in verse 29. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Messiah. How could Paul say this? You know, if we don't understand the reason why, we might be tempted to think that Paul was uh, bragging on himself, you know, saying to the believers in Rome, when I come, I'm going to come in the full blessing of Messiah. I, I really <laughs> am very special. Well, Paul had a reason to say this, and he explains it in the verses preceding this verse here in chapter 15 of Romans. And that's what I want to uh, uh, explain to you here. From verse 14, he has um, been um, telling the believers there in, in Rome about his ministry, that God has called him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And he says uh, from verse 18, and we can begin to read, For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Messiah has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Messiah. It's important to uh, note here that Paul is explaining that it is from Jerusalem that he has been preaching the gospel. In this, in this time, when this letter was written, it was like Jerusalem and Rome were two uh, opposite poles. Rome was the capital of the entire empire in those days, and uh, but Jerusalem was the um, God's, of course, uh, chosen city and, and God's future capital of the world, you, sh you could say. It's the spiritual capital of the world. And before he comes to Rome, he's careful to point out that it is from Jerusalem that I have my ministry. He didn't say uh, it was from Antioch. Why? It was because Yeshua, Jesus appeared to Paul in Jerusalem, uh, actually at the Temple Mount, in the temple, after he had had an encounter with the risen Messiah on the road to Damascus, and he had spent some time, uh, most likely for three years, in the Arabian Desert. He, he returned to Jerusalem, and he says uh, in um, Acts that he went to the temple to pray and there he came into a trance and he saw Yeshua appearing to him, telling him, 
Go, leave this city, because they will not receive you here and what you have to say. Paul had to object. He said, they know me here and they have a great respect for me. Of course they will listen to me. No, Yeshua said, I am sending you far away to the Gentiles. That was his sending. That was his calling from as an apostle sent out by Yeshua himself. That calling was later confirmed in Antioch among the Gentile believers there. Well, there were also Jewish believers uh, in that congregation at Antioch. And the leadership there by the Holy Spirit recognized that calling that Paul had. And the Holy Spirit said, uh, appoint unto me and send out for me Paul and Barnabas to the uh, calling, uh, to the work that I have called them to. They had already been called before, but they were sent out from there. But Paul is explaining, it is from Jerusalem I received my commission. And he says, all the way to Lyricum, uh, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Messiah. And thus, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Messiah has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Uh, We continue here now in verse 22. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain." And to be helped on my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a while. But then he says, before I do this, I I need to do something else. Verse 25. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. It is like Yeshua said to the woman at the well in Samaria, we Jews, we preach what we, uh, what we know is the truth. Because salvation is from the Jews. Salvation, the gospel, has come from the Jewish people. And Paul was very careful to emphasize this in the congregations that he founded, that you have a debt now to the Jewish people for the spiritual riches that you have received from them to now support them materially with financial blessing. So let's read this again. <clears throat> for they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When I therefore have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. And then he says, I know that I, when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Messiah. Why? Because he had ministered to the believers, to the saints, the poor among the saints, um, uh, among the Jewish people in Jerusalem. Uh, and that is why he could make this uh, bold confession <laughs> that he knew that this was going to bring uh, such a blessing on his ministry when he continued from Jerusalem to Rome. He understood he had to complete this um, noble uh, task to deliver a contribution, a, a gift, a donation, a rich donation from the churches that he had founded. Uh, as a pleasing aroma before God. And, and that would cause him to be blessed in return by the Messiah to reach further 
in his ministry. And this is what we're going to need in the end times in order to be entrusted with the harvest that is going to come in. God will not give that to an anti-Semitic replacement theological church. He is going to give it to a people that will bless Israel because they are the ones who are going to be able to bless, um, uh, be blessed by God, I should say, to reap the harvest. Let me show you another example of this in Acts in chapter 10. You know the story about Cornelius, the Roman centurion, who was chosen by God to be the first one to have a baptism of the Holy Spirit with, together with all of his household, uh, just like the apostles and the early believers experienced uh, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Here we see that he became the first fruits from the Gentiles to be blessed in the same way. I'm going to read from verse 1 here. At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God. Uh, it's important to understand what this phrase, fearing God, meant. It was a Gentile who attended synagogue with the Jewish people because he believed in the God of Israel, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He had not converted to become Jewish, but he was uh, still welcome in the synagogue as a Gentile if he kept to certain things like keeping the Sabbath and 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 uh, uh, eating kosher and, and things like that, then he was considered a, a God-fearing person. So it says here, he feared God with all his household and gave alms generously to the people. The Greek text here make it, makes it very clear, uh, and even the translation uh, shows this, that it's talking about the Jewish people, that he gave alms to the Jewish people. Otherwise, it could have uh, been translated just like he gave generously, uh, he gave alms generously to people in general. No, it's to the people. And it's using here in the Greek a word that is never used about Gentiles, only about Jews. So he was a man who loved the Jewish people, cared for the Jewish people. He gave support and alms to the poor among the Jewish people. And then it says he also prayed continually to God. And in verse 3, we see that he kept also the Jewish prayer times because um, this is the afternoon prayer, the evening prayer. It's talking about here, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have um, ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. Uh, and later on it says he, he, he explained that the angel had told him that Peter would speak words to him through which he would become, through which he would be saved. So, and then we read at the end of the chapter how the Holy Spirit fell on him and all his household, and they began to speak in tongues and glorify God. So he was chosen as a recipient of this tremendous blessing as a first fruit from the Gentiles. Why? Because he feared God and he was somebody that gave generously to the poor among the Jewish people. That made him a conduit for the blessing of God, just like God spoke to Abraham, those that bless you, I will bless. That is the blessing that we're going to uh, pray for in the end times, a church, a glorious church that will arise in the end times as a blessing to Israel. Be sure you are in a church that is blessing Israel, or I could say boldly, if they do not support Israel, uh, 
if they belittle Israel, if they don't pay, think is something important with Israel, get out and find another church where you can attend that is blessing God's chosen people. Because God has never removed his calling on the Jewish people. They have been called to bless all the nations, all the families of the earth, even more than what they already have been blessing the world. They've been blessing the world with the Bible. They've been blessing the world with our Savior. They have been blessing the world with the gospel, with the apostles. Every spiritual blessing that has come to the world has originally come through and from the Jewish people. Just like Yeshua said, salvation is from the Jews. And even if they are enemies of the gospel, they will forever be loved because of the fathers. God said, like we read in Jeremiah, I have loved you with an everlasting love. In Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 8, God says that uh, you, Israel, uh, he who touches you touches the apple of my eye. That's the most sensitive part on the human body. When we something touches uh, the pupil in our eye, we immediately react. That's how sensitive God is when something is done uh, that is not correct towards the Jewish people. And before I go on, I need to uh, first read from uh, Psalm 105 when it comes to the promise of the land of Israel. This is so important. I can begin to read here. Uh, from verse 4. Seek the Lord and his strength. This is Psalm 105. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. They are still chosen by God. Hallelujah. Verse 7. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The word that he commanded for a thousand generations. There's different ways that you count the, the, the span of a generation, but at least it is uh, a minimum of 20 years. This means that if it's uh, lasting at least for a thousand generations, it has not expired yet, for sure. The covenant that he made with Abraham, he is a covenant-keeping God. He sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, uh, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. This is something that God will never take back. It is irrevocable, his covenant to give the Jewish people the promised land, the land of Canaan, the land of Israel. And any church that does not respect that and begin to, uh, uh, I should say, um, uh, support and other people to have a right to that promised land. That is a church that is under God's curse, and it cannot be used by him as an instrument in the end times. In the end times, there's going to be a division between the bride and the harlot. And the division line is drawn here which uh, concerning which stand we take when it comes to Israel. So uh, this is something that is so important. We are getting into a situation now where Israel is going to need our support uh, our love, uh, our prayers, our blessings more than ever before because the world is turning against Israel more and more and specifically when it comes to their right to their own 
promised land. Here we must uh, begin to enter into the battle in very serious prayer. Uh, We have the threat from uh, Iran that is growing every day uh, in their threat to destroy Israel, to wipe uh, Israel from the map. We have the threat from the neighbors now around Israel where they are... um, Uh, seeing an opportunity more and more to uh, attack again. The threat is very real today. Not to mention all the terror attacks that are taking place right now in Israel. You might not be aware of this, but I want to give you some newly released statistics. Uh, On average, uh, for the first six months this year, and I will say... This is even now increasing. It's even more now than it was in the first six months. There has been uh, 20 terror attacks every day in average taking place in Israel. 20 terror attacks. That corresponds in the United States like if there would have been 680 terror attacks committed every day against Americans in the first six months of this year. We must put this into perspective because America has so many more people than this little land, Israel, with only nine and a half million people. So um, it's 20 terror attacks a day is corresponding to 680 terror attacks a day in the United States. And uh, a knife stabbing is taking place uh, every day tenth day. That corresponds to three stabbings a day in America. Uh, A shooting attack is occurring every other day, which would mean 18 shooting attacks every day in America. A firebombing, listen to this, there are four firebombings on average every day right now in Israel. And as I said, that is at least what is happening right now. It has in, it's increasing every, all the time now. And stone throwing, which leads to people being death, uh, dying and, the, and uh, definitely being injured for life many times, there is over 11 or has been over 11 such stone throwings on average every day in the first six months this year. That would correspond to 395 stone-throwing attacks every day in the United States. This is what Israel has to deal with right now, plus the tremendous danger surrounding Israel from Gaza in the west, from Lebanon and Syria in the north, from Iran uh, and and Yemen uh, in the east, uh, and also the... Um, Palestinian terror organizations. And beyond that, there is such internal unrest right now in Israel um, that we must pray for the peace of Jerusalem like never before. We God uh, has placed watchmen, it says, on the walls of Jerusalem to cry out to him day and night until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. But not only prayer, we also need to uh, do like Cornelius did when he supported the needy among the Jewish people. Uh, We need to do like Paul did when he came with donations to the needy in Jerusalem in order to have God's favor and blessing upon his ministry. And I also want to mention something that I've had on my heart for uh, a long time now, actually, and that is... Uh, I'm going to read from Ezekiel here, uh, where it says from verse 8, it is uh, a promise for the end times for Israel when God restores Israel. But you, O mountains of Israel, and by the way, 80% of the mountains of Israel are located in what is today called in the media the West Bank. In other words, Judea and Samaria. 
Uh, that's what uh, is referred to with the mountains of Israel. It says here, you mountains of Israel shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they will soon come home. For behold, I'm with you and I will turn to you and you shall be tilled and sown. And I will multiply people on you, the whole house of Israel, all of it. The citizens the cities shall be inhabited and the waste places rebuilt. I want us to be a blessing to Israel by planting trees on the mountains of Israel in fulfillment of this promise in Ezekiel. This is a sign that the Messiah is soon uh, coming, that God is restoring Israel just like he has promised thousands of years ago. We can be a part of this through our good friends at the Hayovel. They are planting fruit trees now all over the mountains of Israel. And we are going to partner with them and give you an opportunity to plant not just one. You can have one tree at least, one or many trees as a statement of faith that you support God's Uh, plan for Israel. You support God's prophetic word. You're being fulfilling prophecy by planting fruit trees on the mountains of Israel. They will yield fruit to God's people that will soon come home. Because this area that the world is trying to take away from Israel, the very biblical heartland, um, all the nations of the earth are trying to Take that away from God's people because Satan is not interested in this promise coming to pass. So, But we need to be uh, standing with God that his blessing will come uh, upon us to support the Jewish people and also as a statement of faith to plant trees. So look out uh, in, 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 for information in days ahead. We're going to explain Uh, more in detail how you can be a part of this to plant fruit trees on the mountains of Israel for God's chosen people in fulfillment of prophecy. So because God is looking for a church in this late uh, hour that will stand with the Jewish people and be blessed by him to reap the harvest of souls in the nations. I want us to look at uh, what Paul is saying about this in Romans Uh, chapter 11. But before I do that, I must also mention something about the unique calling also on the Jewish people. Um, I want us to read in uh, chapter 3 of Romans, where Paul says in verse 1, he's asking a question that is very important here. He says, then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? It's a question that many Christians today would uh, uh, say, well, uh, there is no value anymore in circumcision. Uh, There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. That's what Paul says in Galatians 3, that uh, there's neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave, bond nor, nor free, nor man, nor female, or male or female. We are all one in the Messiah. Well, that we're all one doesn't mean we are the same. Male and female is still different. That's the confusing uh, uh, heresy that is now coming with this uh, um, stupidity in, in, in the nations. God has still created male and female with different callings, with different giftings and, and, and things that he wants them to do in life. That's very, very important. And just like there's still a difference between male and female, there's a difference between Jew and Gentile. So that's why Paul is answering this question in a very, very powerful way in verse 2. But um, I want to read verse 1 again to see this question so clearly. What advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision in Jewish lifestyle, in being, having a Jewish calling? What's the point? Paul says in verse 2, much in every way. 
By the way, let me say this. When Paul says here, what is the value of circumcision? Uh, I want us to go to Galatians here and read in chapter 5, where Paul says in verse 2, Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, that's in other words, if you convert, you who are a Gentile, if you convert to become Jewish, uh, by being circumcised, uh, it says uh, in verse 3, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law, the Torah. So here in uh, Romans 3, uh, what value is there in being circumcised with a calling to keep the entire Torah. Much in every way, Paul says. <laughs> it's, it's very important to see this. He's not saying just, well, there is a, some difference, you know, but he says, no, much. And then he adds, in every way. To begin with, and this is one of the most important aspects, The Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. And then he says, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? Can he revoke that calling to entrust the oracles of God to them? By no means, he answers in verse 4. He says, let God be true, though every man were a liar. So, compared to God, even every person is uh, more or less a liar. God is the only one that is true. Even if everyone should be a liar, God will never be a liar. He will still be true to his promise and to his calling on the Jewish people that is irrevocable. And part of that calling is to be entrusted with the Scriptures, with the Word of God. We know that the Bible has come. It's a Jewish book that has come to us from the Jewish people. Uh, but also th- this this revelation of the Scriptures that uh, God has still not removed, that they have a calling to proclaim the Word of God to the nations. And, um, of course, it says later on in Romans chapter 11, let's read, uh, we can read from verse uh, 25. I'm going to go back and read some of the early verses here, but since I'm on this calling to be entrusted with the oracles of God, it says here in verse 25, lest you, Gentiles that is, Be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening, not a complete hardening, but a partial partial hardening or a blindness, you can also say, has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Uh, Let me just stop there and say, there is still this revelation entrusted to the Jewish people that is uh, a calling to expound the scriptures that God has never removed. But I want us to see from verse 11 here the importance of our role in uh, bringing God's plan of salvation to completion through the Jewish people. Paul says in verse 11, uh, first he says, So I ask, did they stumble, talking about the Jewish people here, did they stumble in order that they might fall? Uh, Some translations add fall permanently and never to rise again. That's what he's referring to here. And he says, by no means. Rather, through their trespass, when they failed, uh, and became dispersed to the nations uh, and rejected when uh, the Messiah came the first time. That's what he's referring to here, Paul. Uh, if their tra- um, 
through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So salvation has come to us through their mistake. If that has blessed the world so much that we Gentiles who are far away from God have been given the opportunity to be uh, come into the family of God by, f- through faith in the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob through his Messiah. That has blessed us so much, their failure, their trespass. Uh, and then he says, Sal- because of that, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Why? So as to make Israel envious. How? Or jealous, it says here. How can they become jealous? Well, if we uh, persecute them, if we curse them, if we do not bless them, how can they be jealous? That's impossible. It's only through us showing blessing and love and support. Uh, That's the only way that they can see that we obviously are in connection with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so that's so important that we have this testimony just like Cornelius had. It said, it says there in Acts chapter 10, later on in the text, that uh, he was well spoken of by the Jewish community at Caesarea because of his his uh, support for them, his love for them. So that's how we need to act also in order to have God's favor because God's calling on the Gentile believers, on the Gentile church, is to uh, cause uh, Israel to become jealous. And then it says here, now if their trespass means riches for the world, which I already explained. And if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion or their fullness mean when all Israel shall be saved? And God is about to bring this uh, about through the restoration of the Jewish people back to their own land And now it's time for us to get on board with the program that God has to support what God is doing to become a blessing to Israel, that God's favor and blessing can come upon us to reach the nations with the gospel to bring in the harvest. That's the purpose of this prayer ministry. Nordic 714 is to pray for the end time revival. And the only way that it can come is through a church that is blessing Israel. Uh, so that's why this is a key to, uh, to, to see the blessing of the harvest coming in, of people coming to faith. Uh, it is through us blessing Israel. So um, because when all Israel is saved, it's going to bring about life from the dead for the whole world. That's what it says in verse 15 here in Romans 11. Uh, Matthew 19.28 uh, says, When the Son of Man comes to sit down on his glorious throne at the renewal of all of creation. Some translations have when the when the the world is regenerated, born again into the kingdom of God, life from the dead for this sin torn world. This is what we are called to become a uh, participants in this plan uh, and be uh, co laborers with God by becoming focused on blessing. Israel in their restoration to their own land. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So uh, let's me, let me read also the uh, towards the end of the chapter here. It says in verse 30, For just as you, talking about Gentiles, were at one time disobedient to God, and were we ever far away in the Nordic countries where I come from, The Vikings, they were cruel, uh, idolaters. They drank themselves uh, intoxicated with beer from skulls of people that they had killed. 
we were so far away from God. But then it says here, you at one time we were disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience. Here it comes back again, because of their failure, because of their trespass, because of their mistake. We have received mercy. Why? Well, it goes on to say, so that they t- too have now been disobedient in order that they, by the mercy shown you, they also may now receive mercy. So through God's mercy upon us, his blessing upon us, we are going to be instruments that can cause mercy to come to Israel. God will use a church that is showing blessing uh, to uh, favor and blessing to Israel to be recipients of his mercy and his grace to become what God has intended us to be. It is through the fullness of the Gentiles that Israel will be saved. That word in the Greek has not only to do with number but also with maturity. When we are receiving God's mercy to such an extent that we're growing up into the fullness, the same Greek word, of the stature of Messiah, then we can show that that mercy to such an extent that also Israel can be jealous uh, for what we have. So this is what God has called us to be part of in the end times. This is what we are to pray for. A church that is blessing Israel, standing with Israel. So we have to be careful that we're doing just like Cornelius did um, and just like we see Paul did through his ministry when he uh, supported the, the, the people, the Jewish people in Jerusalem. So let's pray for this church to come into its calling, its full calling and its full blessing from Messiah. Hallelujah. That's what we need in this hour. Uh, An Israel-loving church. Hallelujah. That's what we are to pray for like never before. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your uh, plan of salvation for this world that you have um, included Gentiles to be an instrument to bring this about uh, through your chosen people, Israel. Help us to stand with Israel, to pray for Israel, to show mercy and support, and to love the Jewish people unconditionally because you love them unconditionally. Hallelujah. You can never take back your love from them. It's an eternal love, even if there are enemies for, for, uh, for the gospel. They are loved by you and lead to be loved by us. So, Father, we pray that this glorious church will arise in the nations that will show favor to Israel. We pray for the nations in the Nordic countries, the churches in the nations uh, of the Nordic countries to be known as those who are standing with Israel and blessing Israel and supporting Israel. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening. God bless you. Remember the uh, prayer points that we have in the description under this video. It's exciting to be part of what God is doing. And soon we will release information how you also can be part of planting trees on the mountains of Israel for the Jewish people that will soon come home. God bless you.